Okay, good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody. Good to be uh, back in the house of the Lord this week. I was out last week with a little stomach issue, but feeling much better, and I'm glad to be here. Um, just glad to be with God's people. <laughs> I miss it when I'm not with you guys. Let's all stand together and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you that we're here to worship you in our own way, God, that you love hearing our voices, that you lean over on your throne and you look down on us and, you're, and you smile upon us knowing that we love you, God, knowing that we're here for you, your creations. We're here to worship you, God, with all of our hearts, Father. Let this not be some rehearsed praise or worship, but let it come from our hearts, God. Let us sing with everything that we have and to let you know that we love you with everything we have. We ask that you be here with us today and be in this place so we feel your presence, God. Again, we love you and we thank you, God, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness and you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can help but sing. Faithful you are Faithful forever you will be Faithful you are And all your promises are yes and amen And all your promises are yes and amen Savior, you have brought me near. You pull me from the ashes and you have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be Faithful you are And all your promises are yes and amen And all your promises are yes and amen Faithful you are Faithful you will be your oh, and faithful you are and all your promises are yes and amen and all your promises are yes and amen Your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. So oh, I will rest in your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. Faithfulness, I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness, so oh, unfaithful you are. Faithful forever you will be, oh, and faithful you are. 
And all your promises are yes and amen And all your promises are yes and amen well, All your promises are yes and amen Amen, amen Sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength My story isn't over, my story's just begun And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does well, Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does Ooh, lay your burdens down Ooh, here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good And failure's never final, when the father's in the room Failure's never final, when the father's in the room Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Prodigals come home The helpless find hope and love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. And love is on the move when the father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith. And love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Jericho walls are quaking, stronghold now is shaking. Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Oh, love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Oh, lay your burdens down. Oh, here in the father's house, check your shame at the door. Cause it ain't welcome anymore You're in the Father's house Oh, prodigals come home The helpless find hope And love is on the moon when the father's in the room Prison doors fling wide The dead come to life Love is on the move When the father's in the room All miracles take place The cynical find faith And love is breaking through When the father's in the room Jericho walls are quaking Strongholds now are shaking Oh, love is breaking through When the Father's in the room Well, love is breaking through When the Father's in the room Oh, lay your burdens down Oh, here in the Father's house 
check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Oh, you're in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore You're in the Father's house Amen Thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father it's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know. We're all searching for answers Only you provide because you know Just what we need before we say your word You're a good, good father It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are And I'm loved by you, it's who I am it's who I am, it's who I am Oh, you're a good, good father It's who you are, it's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am, it's who I am It's who I am You are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways To us You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways to us Oh, you're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am Love so undeniable that I can hardly speak in peace So unexplainable that I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, love, love You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am it's who I am You're a good, good father Oh, you're a good, good father Amen, peace
is the best father. He's a good, good father. And he does love us just how we are. We really don't have to change anything. We don't have to change anything. He loves us no matter what. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. And my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me, His word, my hope. Secures, he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. And my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me and life. Like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below Will be forever mine Will be forever mine And you are forever mine Oh, we thank you, God, that you are forever ours. We thank you that you love us like there's only one of us to love. There's only, like there's only one person in the whole world to love. You give us all of that love. And I thank you for that. I thank you for your acceptance of me and of others, God. Father, right now I ask that you would pour your blessing and anointing upon Pastor Robin as she comes to bring your words that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. How many of you have heard of the greatest generation? Some of you have. Well, this is Pastor Ray Hood. He happens to be my father, and he is part of the greatest generation. And today, we're going to talk about some of his life, and he's going to share some of the many, many miracles that God has done in his life. And um, I think we're going to see a little bit about why his generation accomplished so much. They were given so little, and they did so much because of their hard work and their faith in God. And when we don't have a doctor down the road to call on, we call on God. And he answers. So um, anyway... We're just going to have a conversation. So, Dad, um, would you like to tell us where you were born and when you moved to Oregon? And you have your microphone right there on you, so you don't have to worry. Uh, I was born in Sand Springs, Oklahoma. If you've ever used cur gar jars, When did you come to Oregon? When I was three years old, we came the first time. Can you hear now? Okay. How old were How old were you when you came to Oregon? Three years old. That's better. We, we landed in North Bend. And that was my first memory that I had was being in North Bend. We were only there two weeks when we Dad decided to go to Tacoma to look for work okay. it, during the Depression. Yes, so you were born in 1926. Right. So when you're three, that would have been 1929. Right. Definitely the Depression. Um, and how long were you in Tacoma? Well, uh, not long. Uh, I'm not less than a year. Okay. My, there was a little church there, and uh, the pastor of the larger church, Marshall Mercer, asked Dad if he wouldn't take care of that small church. So uh, that's what we did. Okay. And I seem to recall that you helped your mom create a garden. Oh, yes. Uh, in those days, uh, if we wanted to eat, it was a good thing to make a garden. And so uh, when we came back to Hood River, she had a big, big garden, and we worked hard making that garden. What did you do to help make the garden? Oh, whatever she asked me to. <laughs> I don't remember exactly. Okay. I remember him saying that she would take just a, a, a piece of ground with weeds and rocks and just her little hand tools, and uh, she would start working the ground, and he would pick up the rocks and take them away yeah. Yeah. so that they wouldn't be in the way of the garden. Right. Um, so he learned to work at a young age, and he learned that he was valuable in the family. His work was needed for them to eat. I think, okay, this is my personal opinion, but I think that's really important that our kids need to work. They need to learn that uh, their work is valuable and it accomplishes something. Right. Um, 
And then, what was your nightly ritual before bedtime? Oh, a mother always uh, read a story out of Agamar's Bible storybook. And, and we played church, too. Uh, one, of, one of the kids would pound on the piano, and we'd all sing, and we'd pray. We had our own church. We were kind of out in the country where we didn't have a church, so we had our own. And uh, uh, depression days, uh, uh, Dad was working, so uh, we were uh, alone at home mostly. It seems that something special happened one time when your mom was telling the story about the fishers of men. Yes. <laughs> she was telling about the fishers of men. And for a five-year-old, that's hard to understand. So I kept asking her questions. What is a fisher of men? She said, well, you know, when the preacher stands up and preaches, she said, um, that's a fisher of men. And I said, that's what I want to do. She uh, kind of discouraged me. She said, well, son, that's pretty hard work. And uh, finally I said, does God not need any more fishers of men? And then she said, yes, if you really have it in your heart, God will pro provide a way. So from that time on, I always knew exactly what I was supposed to do. Never talked about it very much, very little, but I knew in my heart exactly what I was supposed to do. And there were times that your family didn't have food. Right. Yes, when we were there in uh, Hood River, out in the farming area, uh, we got to the point where there's, we had only 25 cents left. And uh, so Mother asked us to come and kneel down and uh, pray that Dad would get some work today. So he was walking across the orchard, and the owner came over and said, Mister, he said, I need some help. Would you help me? And so that's how we got money again. God provided a job, didn't he? He did. How about your uh, German landlady? Well, uh, that was when we were in Tacoma, and uh, times were terribly hard. And uh, we got to the place where uh, uh, one, one time when uh, there was no food left, and what there was she gave to us children, and they didn't have anything to eat. Next day, the old German owner came over and she said, I'm wondering, do you kids have any food? Well, she didn't wait for an answer. She went over and started opening the cupboards. And she said, well, there isn't anything here. So she went out and bought a big pile of groceries, and we had <laughs> food again. Yeah. Do you remember a story, and I don't know what family it was, but they didn't have food, and so they gathered around the table, and they started praying? And each person prayed, one person prayed for potatoes, somebody else prayed for chicken, and somebody else prayed for green beans. Do you remember that story? I don't remember that one. Man, I wish my memory was better. Yeah. 
and somebody prayed for a blackberry pie. And when they got done praying, there was a knock at the door and uh, people had brought them food and it was exactly what they had prayed for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. Where were you um, when you went to high school? Well, I was first. Uh, we lived out in a little community called Marble Valley. And uh, to go to high school, we had to ride the bus about 14 miles. And... Uh, one day uh, in the winter, the roads, narrow roads, were very slick, and the bus started spinning around, and there was just enough room on the highway to spin around. And uh, George Flanick was uh, driving, and he said, Lord, help us. And uh, the bus straightened out, and we drove on into Chihuahua, where we were going to school. And when you were in the uh, one-room schoolhouse, yeah, what can you tell us about those days? Well, uh, one winter it got 40 below zero there, and uh, the one-room school had no uh, indoor plumbing at all. Uh, and uh, also uh, no uh, source of water except uh, down at the creek. And uh, so the older boys, uh, uh, we would go down to that creek and chop a hole in the ice and uh, uh, get water and bring it back up to the school. And it seems that there were days that it was so cold that that little potbelly stove had a hard time warming up the room. Oh my, we it got so cold. They never thought about closing school in those days, and no school buses. Um, so. Uh, about all we could do was to get as close to that stove as we could and then keep turning around and around to keep warm. Uh, one time uh, during those days, uh, there was a family that lived, oh, three or four miles from the school, so they w rode a horse to school. And the oldest boy, about my age, uh, was the first one, and he is doing the, the uh, uh, taking care of the horse. And uh, the two others were behind. When he got to school, he, uh, he, we got there before the teacher got there. And uh, as soon as he came in, the other children said, what is wrong with your ears? His ears were completely white. And about that time, they began to thaw out, and he cried like a baby. Uh, I uh, got my feet frostbitten. That means uh, about frozen. And it was true that uh, they didn't hurt much until they started thawing out. And when they started thawing out, then they really hurt. And uh, for some reason, they told us that uh, when they got cold for several years, you will have, they call it chill blains. And so they said, you will have that for several years now. And so, I had that too. Now, what does that mean? Oh, it means uh, uh, your feet hurt and little, it's like, oh, little spikes or something are in your feet. And you started preaching when you were about 17? 
Yes. Uh, my first sermon was in uh, at a uh, youth convention in uh, Walla Walla, uh, Washington, and. Uh, I was trying to remember. I I preached on on David and Goliath, and uh, yeah, that was my first. And then uh, uh, I had uh, even at that early age, I had several opportunities to go and preach. In those days, we had what they called revivals and it might be probably about two weeks. And so I had several of those. So there'd be services every night for two weeks? Yeah. That's awesome. People don't do that around much anymore unless it's some kind of a sports tournament, right? Um, and then you were at a camp meeting, oh, maybe about three years later, and you met a young woman. Yes. Uh, out of Colfax, between Colfax, Washington, and Pullman, uh, uh, the road turned off and went, uh, oh, several miles back in the country. And uh, they had a uh, camp meeting there. And uh, the camp meeting... Um, uh, was really a great experience. It was under a tent, and uh, uh, a lot of the boys slept in the hayloft. Uh, but uh, uh, some of the things I remember, one was that there was a man, Brother Conover, and he would get happy in a service every time, it seems. And he'd begin to shout. And uh, he would shout, and people would just praise the Lord. And uh, But uh, the young people then decided to go up on the hill for kind of an outdoor service. And uh, Bonnie, who... Uh, was not my wife, of course, at the end. She played the uh, organ, uh, uh, accordion. accordion. And uh, actually, she was very mu musical, could play almost anything. But at any rate, at the time, why she was seeing a uh, young man by the name of Keith Plank, and uh, so, at any rate, I maneuvered it so that Keith carried the uh, uh, accordion back down, and I walked with Bonnie. And so, uh, when they went home, she told her friend, who still lives in St. Helens, her name is Martha Burton, she told her, I know who I'm going to marry. She said, who? She said, I'm going to marry Ray Hood. <laughs> so about a year later, you were married when she was just out of high school. Yes, yeah, she was just out of high school. I was uh, almost 22. And um, that first Christmas, she was homesick. I wanted to go home, but the roads were too bad. So you waited till a little bit after Christmas, thinking the roads would be better. Tell us about that story. The whole thing? Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, we went back home. You were, you were living in Portland. Right. And you drove up the highway, high in the gorge, to Milton Freewater. Right. And... Uh, uh, in the winter time, of course, uh, we were in college at Warner Pacific, and uh, so at uh, any rate, uh, uh, we went home. And coming back, um, the weather was very bad, and uh, uh, coming to about the Dalles, 
why uh, the uh, water came up over the uh, wheels and affected the brakes of the car. And uh, we went on down and and uh, just before um, where the dam is, why uh, uh, the uh, a car uh, it very uh, it was just a two lane road and it began to spin around and uh, then it went toward the uh, curb and I thought surely something will stop it but it didn't we went down the cliff it was so steep that the car went endways twice it was an old 40 Hudson very strong build and they told me that was the only car that they we'd have ever lived in but uh, the car broke uh, branches of trees 15 foot high, and it rolled endways twice, then turned on its side, and it would, uh, uh, when it rolled, then it would fall quite a ways. And uh, it fell until we came to the backwaters of the Columbia River. The railroad uh, was on the other side, and it was just water. And then, uh, uh, the car went in and began to sink. And uh, uh, that's when I really <laughs> uh, knew we were in big trouble. But um, the water was in the car, and uh, uh, the passenger side was down. And uh, uh, Bonnie, my wife, uh, was pregnant with our first child. And uh, so she was completely unconscious. And uh, I pulled her up out of the water and said, you have to stay up out of the water so I can try to get us out of here because the car was going down. And so she mumbled something, and, but as soon as I turned her loose, she went right back in the water. So I pulled up again and talked with her again and said, you have to stay up so I can get out. And uh, so I went over and uh, I put my feet against the steering wheel and uh, begin to push the door open. Uh, it had metal, uh, uh, well, it wasn't fenders, but the, f f f uh, the running board. Running board, and they were metal. And uh, when the uh, rector said, he said, "I don't know how in the world you got that door open, but it got open." And uh, uh, when I got it open, I helped Bonnie, and we got out on the bank. And uh, we looked up. It was dark by then, and we saw two lights coming down the hill. And uh, one of them, uh, as I recall, I'm sure, was a doctor. And so uh, he... Uh, uh, gave us both shots for shock, and then they took her uh, one on each side and helped her up the bank. Uh, we had gone down about 350 feet, and uh, another car just a little closer uh, to the dam had gone down 30 feet and killed one or two people. But at any rate, we got back up on top. They took us back to Hood River in the hospital there. And um, the hospital was crowded, so Bonnie had to be uh, put uh, in the hallway. And she said all night long, people were talking about 
such a miracle. I uh, was down in the basement. Uh, it seemed like the basement, I think it was. But at any rate, uh, um, I didn't consider myself uh, checked into the hospital. We had friends there, and so uh, I uh, called up and went over to their place, and pretty soon uh, they have, there's a knock on the door, and they from the hospital came after me and said, you're still in the hospital, so I had to go back. But at um, any rate, uh, we came out of that, and at the time we were in our first church, which was Woodburn, Oregon. And uh, so uh, when we got out of that, we got a bus and uh, come on back to Woodburn. As I recall, when they were looking for dad, they went to mom's room and said, we don't want to worry you, but your husband's missing. Do you have any idea where he would go? And she said, oh yes, we have friends here. He went to visit. <laughs> <laughs> she knew him. Um, and the miracle didn't end there. Neither one of them were injured. But what did they say about the baby? Well, I told the doctor immediately about it. And he said, he said, you're lucky to be alive. He said, we can't expect a baby. But uh, the baby was born on time. That was our oldest son, uh, Gary, and uh, he is born uh, no problem whatsoever, full term. He was born in Salem. Uh, uh, the doctor decided to do a cesarean operation, and so I was back there as far as I could get, probably further than I was supposed to. But they uh, brought him out, carrying him by the heels. And uh, so at any rate, uh, he was a healthy child and got along fine. Yeah. Um, and tell us about, I think it was mom's grandfather. Oh, yes. We uh, made a trip down into Arkansas, and uh, her grandfather was an old, what they called a, uh, uh, he didn't have a church. Uh, he t traveled and went to schoolhouses and would hold services for them. But... Uh, they lived in a little house. It was not much more than a shack. But when I went in that house, I felt the presence of God so strong. It was a mighty thing. But at any rate, uh, uh, when a storm uh, back there, they would have those storms, wind storms, and tornadoes. tornadoes. And uh, Grandpa would go out there and look at this storm and pray. And all the time they lived there, not one storm was able to come through. But the day they buried him, nine storms came through. Tornadoes. <laughs> yeah. He prayed them away. Yeah. <laughs> He as, did. And as I recall, you told God you wanted the kind of spirit that he had. Oh, yes. Great, great man of God. My goodness. It's just as soon as I got in the room, the whole house seemed like it was just filled with the power and presence of the spirit. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah. Trying to remember some of the other miracles. Well, 
um, we went from Woodburn back to uh, Phillipsburg, Kansas, where um, some of Bonnie's folks were, and um, held meetings there, and then um, we traveled some uh, just holding special meetings, and we uh, traveled uh, 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 through a little town. It was called Depew, and uh, I can remember the place uh, in the road uh, when the Spirit of God spoke to me so plainly that uh, I wondered if Bonnie could hear it too. But I looked over and she heard nothing. But uh, it said, this is where you're going to be. And I said, well, Lord, if that's true, uh, you're going to have to make it mighty plain because I don't even like the looks of this place. And we went on out to my aunt's place, Aunt Bessie, and uh, she had uh, she hadn't been a Christian really, uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, she had come into the little basement church in Depew, become a Christian, and so we were only going to be there a few days. She called up on Wednesday night and asked if uh, I could do the service. And so we did, and then we went on to another place. And about two weeks later, a letter uh, caught up with us, and it said, uh, we have unanimously uh, voted to ask you to come and be our pastor. So we were there then for not a long time, but uh, some really great things happened. Uh, there were three of the uh, uh, white churches. There was also a church uh, of the colored folk. And uh, there's the Methodists and the Baptists and the Church of God, but none of them had uh, anything for the young people. So we started having services in our home for the young people. And they would come to our house and we would play games and uh, and outside even playing. And uh, then we would come back in and uh, have a worship service and uh, a sing and uh, uh, testify and all those things. And in that situation, uh, uh, several of the young people uh, became Christians uh, and from the uh, other churches. So one time the Baptists were having a, a, a spatial meeting, and so we took our young people and went over to the Baptist church for the revival meeting. And in that time, uh, one of the, our young people went to the altar uh, to be saved. And uh, the uh, pastor didn't quite know what to do because uh, uh, they weren't from his congregation. And uh, so they asked me what they wanted, and I said, they want to be Christians. And we had a service, and uh, it was a great service. In fact, uh, a lot of the old-time Baptists were just uh, so happy, said, we haven't seen anything like this in years.
so we stayed there then, and uh, Bonnie uh, taught school there for a while, and uh, we became friends with the different people. And one day, up at the uh, school where the kids were playing games, the old uh, superintendent came to me, and uh, he says, what are you doing to those young people? And I didn't know what he was talking about, and I said, well, I don't know what's wrong. I thought they must be doing something they weren't supposed to. He said, I've been in this business all of my life, and I've never seen young people like this. At the end of the year, he uh, resigned or retired and moved down into Texas. And his wife wrote back and she said, for the first time, he is going to church. And so we just had to pray that he found the Lord there. So he could see the difference in the young people you were working with? Oh, yes. He said, I've never seen young people like this. Never. Yeah. They were honest, yeah. hardworking, respectful. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, they were they were Christians and they they just lived it in school and the old superintendent he he just never seen anything like that before. Yeah. That's great. Um seems like you had a run in with a sheriff. Yes. Uh the um uh, lawman, I'm not sure just what they called him, but he uh, was a law. He was also an ex-bank robber, and uh, he was known for being a uh, cruel man. He, he couldn't own a pool hall, so they put the pool hall in his wife's name. He spent a lot of time there. Well, um, the pool hall was also a bar. What? It was also a bar, a saloon. The pool hall also served alcohol. Oh my, yes, that's yeah. what they were. Even though at that time, uh, Oklahoma was supposed to be a dry state, but it wasn't very dry. But um, uh, his name was Stacy Howard, and uh, if Stacy didn't like someone, he would just take and what they call pistol whip him, and he'd just drive him out of town. And uh, I knew uh, a family that was running for the school board, and uh, Stacy didn't like him. And they told me, it said, we're afraid to even go home at night because of him. But one day, he was doing some things that I knew were wrong. So I went down to his pool hall and said, Stacy, I'd like to talk to you. I was only a young man, about maybe 24 or 5. And... Uh, he said, whatever you have to say, you can say in front of my friends. Friends. So I said, well, all right. And I told him what he was doing wrong. And he was so angry. He said, I would just as soon pistol whip you as anybody else. Uh, and when I turned, I fully expected that gun to come down over my head but he was afraid to do it. He knew that that, uh, uh, that was one thing that would turn the people against him, and so he just wouldn't do it. From then on, he had the highest respect for me. <laughs> yeah, that was Stacy Howard. 
And your young wife wasn't real thrilled about your courage. Pardon me? Your young wife wasn't thrilled oh, about your courage. Oh, my, no. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Um, I know there have been many miracles, many amazing stories along the way. Um, including, I, I guess it would be about 15, 20 years ago when God healed you. The, the doctor thought you had about six months to live with right. cancer. Right. And uh, God healed you instead. Yeah. And, and then, um, oh, about seven months or so ago, you had a major stroke. And once again, God provided. And the doctor couldn't even find any evidence. Uh, uh, the neurologist called me and said, what happened here? Because this isn't the way it works. I can't find any damage. And then, um, again, about a month ago, God saved your life once more right. um, when you had pneumonia and sepsis, and the doctor did not think you'd live. No. But you said, tell everyone to pray. And yeah. 24 hours later, he was sitting up in a chair. He was exercising. He was eating. His kidneys were working better. He was hardly using the oxygen they were giving. Um, and, and the doctor, excuse me, the doctor says, he's kicking butt. Then I think he realized that wasn't very professional. And he goes, he's doing really well. <laughs> but I, I told him, I had people praying, and he says, it worked. It worked. Be and, and he came in to visit just to, in awe and respect. He wanted to come and visit with him. Um, Dad, what was, what was the hardest time in your life? Well... The hardest time was we were in St. Helens 25 years, and uh, the congregation grew from about 25 to, uh, it was averaging uh, almost 700. And uh, so it was home, but uh, uh, we went to a, a uh, meeting of uh, ministers, and when we come home, uh, both of us at the same time knew that uh, our work there was finished. So one of the men came and tried to uh, talk with me. He said, there's not a person in this church that wants you to leave. But uh, that wasn't uh, what the Lord was saying. So we went to uh, Olympia, Washington. Olympia had quite a number of people, uh, but uh, uh, they had never had a pastor very long, and then they would have trouble. And... Uh, one of my friends, uh, or a man older than me, but uh, he did a lot for building a church house and so on. But uh, when he, he left, he was almost out of his mind. Uh, but uh, uh, that church had had that kind of trouble. Uh, I visited... Uh, when I was in college, and uh, the pastor uh, talked with uh, us boys, and he was so upset that he just kind of poured out his heart because there was so much trouble. And uh, so that was really a very, very hard time. Um, but... Um, uh, one reason is because the church was so divided. There were, uh, 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 I figured there were five separate groups, and uh, each group wanted me to be a part of them. But uh, that didn't seem right to me, uh, so I didn't uh, uh, become a part of any one group. 
And uh, so when we come into times of trouble, then there was no uh, groups that really stood up for me. There were people that did. But at uh, any rate, that was a very, very difficult experience. And uh, so then we uh, uh, left there and came back down to Hillsboro here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And started the church here. Yeah. And along the way, uh, you lost a son. Yes. Um, that was, uh, we were in St. Helens then. And uh, Doug was our second son. He was born in Oklahoma. Um, the um, uh, Doug was uh, a preemie, and uh, he uh, uh, it was he was born in November, and it was cold. No old parsonage had no insulation at all, and uh, so. Uh, uh, but as a baby. He wouldn't let anyone uh, help her. And so uh, Bonnie would stay up at night in front of a little a gas fire, fire stove. And uh, she would take care of him. And uh, uh, I wanted to, but he just wouldn't let me. Uh, but at any rate, uh, how far do you want me to go? Well, on? he was he was twenty when he he passed away. Yes, uh, he was over in Boise, Idaho, and he uh, told the pastor Wednesday night. He said, "I'd like to talk with you." And Doug was his sight was not good, uh, so he had his grandpa's. Uh, large, old uh, King James Bible, and the pastor told me, he said, for two hours, he said, he pastored to me, and he said, um, but then he was working there at a garage. He came home, and uh, his friend uh, was trying to kill himself. And uh, uh, Doug grabbed the gun away from him, but he, he hung on to it. So it uh, killed Doug instantly. Uh, Doug's dream was that he would be a missionary, but he was killed instantly. And that was for myself and the family, it was, uh, I think, the hardest thing I ever went through. It was so hard. They, uh, uh, when they brought the body back to uh, St. Helens, uh, I wanted to go down and see him. And my oldest son said, no, Dad, you don't want to. So it, it was, at any rate, it was so hard. And uh, so he's buried out there, uh, out of St. Helens in Yankton Cemetery, along with uh, Bonnie. One of the things I remember, though, more than once, uh, Doug talking to you and mom and saying, I would gladly give my life for this friend if he would find the Lord. Yeah. And I believe that's what happened. Yeah. That his, his love for his friend uh, made the difference. Yeah. And now, here we are. You're going to be celebrating your 94th birthday. It's amazing. You and Mom started this church here. Um, 
Many people have come through your ministry over the years. Many people have found Jesus. Many people have found physical healing, right. spiritual healing, relationship healing. Yeah. Um, and of course, they have their own choices and they go their own ways, right? But God has certainly used you. And uh, we want to say thank you to you today and that we love you and we want to bless you in Jesus' name. And for each person who is out there who is listening, I want to remind you, it doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter if you had money or not. As you heard, they didn't have money as he was growing up. Um, as we were kids, uh, money was tight, but God always provided. He always provided somehow. And... Um, I'm reminded of a quote I read from Dale Carnegie. Some of you will remember his name, some won't. He was a great motivational speaker in this country at one time, and he said, it doesn't matter where you're from or what your name is or what your background is or what color you are or whatever else. It doesn't matter the circumstances. It matters what you think. And when what you think is transformed by God, all things are possible because God can do all things. Right. Um, he and sure he can, can take He can take anyone's life and use it for good. He surely can. I've seen it many, many times, and uh, actually, in the last few months, I've been getting letters from people that. Uh, uh, that God has performed marvelous miracles, and they write to thank and uh, appreciate it. Uh, years ago, uh, I helped them. Yeah. 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 Can, can we pray? Lord God, I want to thank you for this dear life and I thank you for each one who's here and for each person who is listening over the air on the internet. God, you know each one of us, you know our hearts and you have a plan to use us. And some people have a more visible life than others but you have a plan for every single life. And it's not that exciting things happen every day, there's hard times, there's good times. Um, but it's that you are with us and where your presence is, anywhere can be a sanctuary. Lord God, we give our lives to you. We ask for your forgiveness and that you would come into our lives, into our hearts and transform us into the people you want us to be and that you would use our lives for your kingdom and your glory to make a difference for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. I need to go to the bathroom. Back. shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon and be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Amen 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 His favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 he's for you he's for you and amen amen shine upon you and be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Father I ask that you do pour this blessing upon everyone here <laughs> what a blessing it is just to know Pastor Ray I've actually I've never met a man as humble and as just as uh, sweet, such a sweet spirit as he has, God. It's truly been a blessing to be his friend and to know him. Father, I ask today that you would walk with us through this week, bring us back next week, God, and that we always keep you in the front of our mind, God, that your face would shine upon us and your light would shine through us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You were just missed.